coming soon, October 2020, on the Eureka Podcast Network. Sarah Soapbox is essentially a rant. It is a collection of my opinions on subjects of my choice presented to you via piggybacking off of my best friend's podcast. There's absolutely nothing that qualifies me for this position other than a sense of righteous indignation, a self-proclaimed wicked sense of humor, and the fact that I essentially have nobody left to piss off. I've already offended all of my closest friends and family, and I think it's about time that we brought in that radius to a much more generalized audience. So without further ado, might I present to you a peddling of my personal, political, and social agenda. Join me next time. Or die. Keep your ears open for Sarah's Soapbox on the Eureka Podcast Network, coming October 2020. There were no birds singing on that gloomy May morning in my modest town, nestled in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains. I had my rubber boots on and an umbrella in tow as I left my old house to take a short rainy day walk. Nestled in the California hills within a few blocks from my old front steps to the north, west, and east sat three decaying graveyards. I chose the one that was the closest, and in only minutes of walking, I was opening a rusted iron gate into history. The hills were silent with the exception of raindrops dripping off leaves of towering oak trees, their own fallen dead twigs snapping under my boots, pushing into the dirt to eventually decay into the burial grounds. Fresh glowing bright green moss smothered its own dark and aged growth that was now one with the crumbling headstones. The image reflected in puddles gathered in deep crevices. Mother Nature and Father Time had rattled the earth, splitting the monument stone. The weather was odd for that time of year, but it felt just right in this misty historic cemetery. The hand-carved grave markers, some easily readable and some worn completely smooth, do not tell me enough about their occupants below. Only fading names and dates from as far back as the 18th century, and birthplaces from as far away as the other side of the world. For over 20 years, I have regularly visited these graveyards, attempting to imagine the hundreds of stories untold. I'm usually the only one there. Am I the only visitor of the men and women who risked it all on a game of chance? A siren blared in the distance and from the top of the hill, I looked down over one of the first main streets of California. I could see the roof of my house from there. I was amazed that steps away from my own bedroom Settlers who altered the future of a brand new California and the entire country forever rested. You see, I was born and raised in one of the oldest cities in the state, right here in the Motherlode, the hospital I was born in, and both my elementary and high school were literally just footsteps away from prominent gold mines and historic creek beds that had once funded this nation. My name is Andrea Anderson. I am a dream chaser and a gold rush historian and genealogist. In my past, I spent a decade as a traveling showgirl and female empowerment educator. 16 years ago, I became a proud mom. I have three amazing children who like me were all born and raised in the California motherload. We've been lucky enough to spend our childhood in a region that is incredible enough to be a tourist hub for people from all over the world. The waterfalls at Yosemite National Park are closer to me than any city or any town with a shopping mall. Growing up in the Motherlode, it was normal to take a ride on a horse-drawn stagecoach 
and pressing your nose to the window of a 100-year-old candy shop as you eyed soft taffy being pulled. Wild West madams passed by windows on decorated horses. Crowds gathered as costume yelping bandits on horseback led faux shootouts, challenging groups of glittering rodeo queens in the middle of the intersection. A short drive away, you could see the annual frog jumps made famous by Mark Twain. A few miles away in either direction are reservations that belong to the descendants of the local native tribes that once kept this land. Indigenous people work together with Mother Earth in unity, cherishing, protecting, and celebrating every inch of land we all dwell on. A land that would soon be ravished. Everywhere you go, reminders are surrounding my community of its burning past. And even then, not all of us talk about it. This is where I'm from, Gold Country. Sonora, California, the queen of the southern mines. Nearly two years ago, I received a health diagnosis that took me off my feet. In that strange time, I shut down. I was depressed and became truly obsessed with researching my family history. From what I knew, my family was white and I'd been living in the United States for a few hundred years. But I found out through a not so deep family tree dive that my own DNA proved that I was also a granddaughter to generations of strong Native American women who walked from Georgia to Oklahoma on the Trail of Tears. My great aunt Rebecca Tikanaski Nugent was the last living person who had made that treacherous journey. And I had grandmothers from Nicaragua, and they were a working part of the California gold rush. It took me 36 years to realize the mother load's rich history, which had always intrigued me, was also my own. In our California elementary school textbooks, we can read numerous glorified stories. Nearly all of them were men's stories and names. Although this is not surprising if you just look at the numbers. When California was made a state, non-Native American women were scarce. The non-white population of Natives and Mexicans were mostly left undocumented. The population of white females rose from 3% to a whopping 8% during the entire gold rush. So it led me to wonder, what was it like for those women here in the 1850s? What hardships did they face? And what victories or successes were they able to realize? Who were the first women who came to California? And who were the women that were already here? I embarked on a search to learn what life was like for the women like my great-great-grandmothers. The lessons I learned... I may as well myself struck gold. They were stories of brilliant, legendary women who made their own way in a time where women were not so welcome to do so. Known, but barely heard of women whose stories contributed to the shaping of the future of the United States of America. And I want you to know their names. Now, let's set the scene with a quick dive into what California was like before the beginning of America's largest migration, the Gold Rush. I am Andrea Anderson, and this is Queens of the Mines. Before the gold rush, Mexican Alta California, essentially Monterey, and all the way up to Sacramento, was Mexican territory. It was inhabited by the native California tribes and the Mexican ranchers that were referred to as Californios. 
The Californios were not connected to or working with the government in Mexico City. Alta California was similar to what we would now call sort of off the grid. Any white settlers in the region were mostly American citizens who had traveled from back east, and they were by far the minority. For its size, California was in fact the most diverse area of North America, linguistically. There are accounts of up to 90 different languages first spoken by the indigenous people of California, descending from 20 major ancestral languages. The Spanish language came next, and just before the gold rush, the majority of the population was speaking Spanish. And just ahead, an article in the first state constitution in 1849 would decree that all laws must be published in Spanish and English. From its birth into the nation, and for three more decades, California would be bilingual. A sleepy village was resting quietly in the bay to the west in the fog, once called Yerba Buena, the newly named San Francisco had poorly built canvas tents and handcrafted shacks, and there lived less than 800 people there. As Yerba Buena, it was once a busy port town whose population had dwindled after the Canadian fur trading empire, the Hudson Bay Company, had sold its holdings and left. Most of Yerba Buena's community had followed. Nomads and renounced sailors remained. The California Star newspaper was still in circulation, and that fading business was owned by a journalist by the name of Sam Brannan. A Spanish missionary in Yerba Buena, under the direction of Father Uniper Cerro, had established the Mission Dolores, which had been operating for 73 years. One mission of 21 that had been established along the coastal towns. The objective was saving souls. In reality, the objective shepherded the enslavement and death of many indigenous people. It was literally only the soul they were trying to save. And the quality of life, while the indigenous person was alive, was of no concern. If they were to die sooner, it was just another soul sent to heaven to be saved. Missions were little more than concentration camps, where conversion to Catholicism was forced. Friars whipped, beat, burned, and tortured the California natives in the missions. The workforce lessened as the natives died and they ventured out for new blood. Yet some remaining converted natives later continued to willingly live at Pueblo Dolores after their cultural disruption among the nearly 5,000 that were buried there. The land that was further into the hills of the Sierra Nevada mountains had been settled by the Mexican ranchers the Californios. My hometown was named by the miners who founded the town after coming from Sonora, Mexico. They lived among the native California tribes who were hunters and gatherers, surviving on nature's bounty. The native men hunted rabbits and deer and pulled a variety of fish and shellfish from the nearby waters. The women collected berries, roots, acorns, and fruit. They worked with the changing winds the tribes moved, season to season, place to place, where the food was plentiful and shelter was accessible. Before the colonization by Spain, Russia, and Mexico, there were over 300,000 natives living here. And just before the gold rush, America's largest migration, only 150,000 remained. The surviving natives on the coast were most likely forcefully converted to Catholicism and doing back-breaking labor at a private ranch or for Spanish missions, underfed, overworked, and sick or dying from the diseases brought by the fair-skinned newcomers. The tribes that rested in the foothills were snugly tucked away with family in their cozy cedar or redwood plank homes a crackling fire burning inside for warmth, forming a white pillar of smoke fading into the night sky, unaware of the horrors that lay just ahead.
Are you enjoying the podcast? Please make sure to rate and subscribe wherever you listen. It literally helps the podcast just as much as a financial donation. If you do want to contribute and get rewarded for it, check out our Patreon program and subscribe to our newsletter at queensofthemines.com. Okay, back to the story. Fifty thousand acres was the agreement between the two men. Los California's governor, Juan Bautista Alvarado, had just decided to grant a vast amount of acreage to the gentleman before him, whom he believed to be a displaced Swiss military officer with a French passport. The governor was making this deal in hopes that the arrangement would assist in diminishing American encroachment on the Mexican territory. 50,000 acres under the condition that this Swiss man became a Mexican citizen. Months later, that man from Switzerland stood over his group of men working at his private empire on the land granted to him by Alvarado. On the acreage crossed two viable rivers, the American River and the Sacramento River. He stroked his mustache with the inside of his first finger while his thumb rested on the small patch of dark hair under his bottom lip. Eyebrows furrowed. He was there to check in with the hired white man overseeing the work, and he was frustrated and bitter towards the slaves that were sweating for his gain. Although there were some paid white employees, the vast majority of this man's workers were not European, American, or the Californios. The Swiss man, whose name was Johann August Suter, was now calling himself John Sutter, and he had fled Switzerland as a wanted man 15 years before. He left his wife, his five children, and an enormous debt that he could not repay behind in Europe. He had not only tricked the governor into this land he now called New Switzerland, but he had also enslaved nearly 800 local Native Americans, as well as some Hawaiians that he had acquired on his journey to California. Sutter stomped back to his homestead on the property. He may have seemed collected, but he was steaming with anger inside. His slaves had not dug the ditch as deep as he instructed. It was too shallow, enough to cause water to back up under the current project, and it created a disaster. This would put them back for months. So he tasked James Marshall with supervising the men who were working their lives away for John Sutter as they were building his empire and operating Sutter's Fort. If you were a female California native living under John Sutter's rule, your life would have looked beyond bleak. As a punishment for your race and for your gender, you would endure recurring rape and violence. Your children would possibly be stolen and sold off or even given away as gifts to the greedy white men. You would be punished by violence if you attempted to escape. In an unwilling exchange of your fire-warmed hut, you now slept on a cold stone floor without bedding. And you did this alongside the men of your tribe and surrounding tribes, who used to sound tall and proud in front of you and before the sun and moon. Together, You all once performed in beautiful ceremonies and provided life's necessities to your close-knit family. These same, now discouraged men, can no longer gather with you to enjoy the bountiful meals from nature that you all made with love by your own hands. Instead, now, you use your hands to fight for and feed yourself the thin porridge they called sick 
as you knelt over a crowded pig trough under the blistering sun. You all now worked with no reward with the exception of John Sutter's scraps of tin redeemable only at his own store. Wow, how generous of this American hero. I want to take a quick pause in this episode long enough to say that these men do not star in the episodes of this series. The dreary story blossoms with incredible color, but as you may know, or you might just be finding out, history, like nature, below rich, vibrant gardens of wildflowers, are deeply twisted roots buried in the dark. Okay, back to the story. Pure anticipation and excitement could easily be sensed from the shuffling outside the hatchway. There is a knocking at the door. The rapping grows louder and more persistent as John Sutter sets his book down on the chair near his bed and moved at his own distinguished pace across the room. It was early, and he had yet to even have his coffee. He opened the door to an impatient James Marshall, who, upon finally seeing Sutter, revealed a large grin under his dark, unkempt beard. The man was a 37-year-old carpenter and the operator of the sawmill for Sutter's Fort. He was also supervising the native slaves and the work they were doing in and around the river. On this particularly chilly January morning in 1848, Marshall had finished inspecting the tail race for slits and debris while all alone on the river and had now arrived bearing stunning news for his boss. Minutes later, they both sat quietly, staring in awe at what sat tucked away in a cloth in Marshall's hand. After testing it, they knew for certain it was gold from right there in the American River. Marshall kept quiet while Sutter paced back and forth, one hand on hip, one hand fingering his facial hair, his mind racing. Surely, if word spread about this find, it would be detrimental. He stood, looking out the window, envisioning his land, swarmed with men, imagining them destroying his agricultural empire in the making. All would be lost. With that devastating thought in mind, James Marshall and his boss put a plan into motion to keep this discovery silent while John Sutter attempted to acquire as much surrounding land as possible. Less than four months later, on a May afternoon, American ex-journalist Sam Brannan was busy putting a plan of his own into motion. Brannan, who had abandoned his post at the California Star in Yerba Buena, was now a merchant in New Switzerland. He discovered gold on his own and stored it in a glass jar traveled to San Francisco and famously paraded up and down the streets of the port town of nomads yelling, gold, gold, gold from the American River. And before you could even imagine, the city was nearly empty as the settlers hastily pressed to Sutter's Fort. So that's that. That is how it started. Sam Brannan then began his success story as California's first millionaire considering that he had first established the store with all of the mining equipment and supplies that would obviously remain in hot demand. And he set that up before his big announcement. However, Sutter's own story did not end with as much accomplishment. Just as he had feared, his land was indeed ravished, and everything was in fact lost. Furthermore, the news of gold beyond imagine was spreading like a California wildfire and there was an unimaginable number of people on their way. It seemed as if the entire world was rushing to California, and men were not the only pioneers with stars in their eyes. Frontier pioneer Eliza Inman wrote in her journal in 1843, If hell laid to the west, Americans would cross heaven to reach it. It looks like she was right. The Queens of the Mind series 
features the stories of 10 unique queens, each of them having their own trait, which I believe they are the queen of. And this is a trait that I believe was rampant in the making of early California. Make sure you listen to all 10 chapters. Chapter 10 is coming next week. And we will wrap up the first season of Queens of the Mines. In the second season, you will hear the stories of women that I believe are modern day counterparts to each of these queens. And we will hear their stories and struggles of their time in California now. And we will see how true the saying, history repeats itself, actually is. We will hear from a Mexican woman dealing with immigration issues, a black woman in our community discussing Black Lives Matter, a current sex worker in California in the fight for decriminalization, a trans person living in the motherlode, a woman who lost her home to natural disasters, someone dealing with depression and suicidal thoughts. We will speak to someone from missing and murdered indigenous women of California and more. Our issues are interconnected and just because a problem doesn't affect you doesn't mean you get to ignore it. We cannot solve one inequality without addressing another inequality. It seems exhausting but it is the right thing to do. Like the queens in Queens of the Minds, we must take action for change, despite what others may think of us. Launching on October 2nd, 2020, the Eureka Podcast Network. The goal of this network is to raise the volume for minority, LGBTQ, and other less heard voices in the mother road. Tune in for season two on Queens of the Minds to Eureka Podcast Network, as well as my new historical show, which is an audio tour of California historic cemeteries with special guests, AKA the residents of said cemeteries. Also not passing a show sharing a trans person's experience in the mother load and rep presents the rural equality project podcast and so much more. Keep up with everything by subscribing to our newsletter at queensofthemines.com.